carbohydrate and you got oxygen, it's going the other direction because the carbon dioxide goes water. And if you don't have enough oxygen, there's carbon monoxide. Oh well. Okay. Well. one of these people. Uh, small class is nice. <clears throat> pray for the two people who aren't here today. We pray that you help them to keep up on top of what we're covering. Um, pray that as <clears throat> we talk about the lab last week and we uh, talk about how we're going to do the lab next week, that would be really helpful for us. And also, the time we have today, <clears throat> talk about the periodic table. We just Pray that you'd help me to clear things up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, I want to share something from the way in this morning. <clears throat> um, you ever, you know, in my Bible reading, when I'm going in and drive, I only do it once a week because it's one time I drive in here, usually. So I was playing, have it play instead. You know, the, what's it called, U version? Yeah, anyway, play, had it play. Psalm 89 is really neat because. It's one of the Levites who wrote this song. Um, it's talking, referring to David and how God, you know, God said that I find David a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And he promised David that there would always be one of his sons sitting on the throne, one of his descendants. Of course, who ultimately was the last descendant sitting on the throne of the party? Jesus the Christ, yes. He's not that's why Mary had to be traced, but they have a genealogy, and that's where it's Matthew or Luke that traces Mary. But it goes back to David. They can trace it back to David. And that was why they showed him that he's legitimately the king. Uh, but anyway, it says, um, My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. Talking about David. I will establish his offspring forever, and his throne as the days of the heaven. If his children forsake my law, do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes, and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod of their iniquity with stripes. But then it says, But I will not remove from him my steadfast love, or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my mouth. And God is saying, I made this promise to David, that's not going to change. And I was thinking this for us know that we've trusted Christ. There's times that we mess up and God disciplines us like a parent does children, but he never removes his love for us. He's not going to say, I made you my child, you're no longer my child. That's not going to happen. He makes a promise, he doesn't break his promises. So, I thought that was cool. Okay, um, that's the periodic table that's available. I made a, uh, I put it online, a, a link to it so you guys can print it out. <clears throat> I look to see if I have more of these, and I have a couple of these in different forms, but I don't have enough for everybody to have one. I need one for myself. But on the back, I put all oh, I my guy on, which is kind of handy. You guys have a way of laminating these, otherwise, I'll talk to Christine and see about what we can do. Um, something like this. It doesn't have to exactly be the one we put on mine. This is similar. I like this one. Um, I like both of these. But uh, at any rate, we have the alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals. We'll come back to this section. And you got the boron family, the carbon family, the nitrogen family and the oxygen family. But then this, this next to last one is called the halogens. And, the, and this last one right over here is the inner gas of the noble gases. So you want to know those names eventually. But this section here is called the transition elements. We've got actinide and lanthanide series, LA and AC. Now, the, what I don't like about this is these actually two belong right there. And then the rest of this belongs in there. 
So it should be more like this. See that? And see that says LAAC? And then this goes right in there. And this other, yeah, this one shows it better. And again, that this one they put the LAAC there and it shows that going in there. This one said this whole group was in there. That's true. But see, this what they made this is 15, but it's only 14 long. This is go one, three, five, seven. That's <clears throat> orbitals. Each orbital has two electrons. So two, one double is two, three double is six, five double is ten, seven double is fourteen. So this should be 14 years. So these two really belong up here <clears throat> as part of the transition elements, really. <coughs> Got something on the wrong too. So that's one thing I don't like about that particular one, as long as you understand that. And your books. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got something on the wrong too. Each book you have will always have on the front page. It'll have, I think the physical science of you. <coughs> has that and they'll have that in the front page here and the uh, you notice you go actinite and anthonite here it's part of the transition elements of those ten these down here go right in between these if you can put them in there <clears throat> so um, And Emery? 
Okay, good job, guys. Um, I want to point out, this one's kind of hard to do when you're learning the scientific method to explain, but some of you did what were clear in your hypothesis. There should be something specific about the balloon. You know, not just saying in general, somebody said something like, if we use the scientific method, then we'll be the better, or do experience the future, I understand. That's true in general, but I need something specific about whatever it might be due, okay? So if I put the spread in, I expect you know, the balloon would be this size and circumference, or I expect the variance to be about 5 or 10 percent. There's lots of different ways you could have come up with. Um, so, also show your work with dimensional analysis. Uh, and if you're not, don't need dimensional analysis to show your calculation, like the volume of that. Uh, you calculate the volume based on circumference, etc. So actually show the work, at least write it down, you know, what it is. I, instead of just giving me the results, I should see uh, how you did the calculation of volume, instead of just seeing the volume. Work. Okay? And it's, um, okay, let's see what we're... Okay, so who's here? Benjamin is not here. Gavin is not here either. And yes, Gavin is not here. Do anybody know about Gavin, what the deal is there? His sister's one of the heart transplant. That's right. Um, you know, an interesting story. Um, I have a, we're originally my wife and I and our family from California, we moved here in 2005. Uh, but at that time, just before we moved here, they, about the time we moved here, they adopted my uh, brother-in-law's wife, because she couldn't have children, uh, adopted about just going almost three-year-old at the time, little girl. She was, you know, the state had, her uh, was taking care of at the time, she had a heart problem. And uh, she had a hole in her heart, about the size of a descent piece or something, they said. For a girl that small, that's pretty big. They put a balloon in there, expand it, and somehow it makes that hole collapse, and whatever. They were able to seal it. And she's been active and has had any problems since then. She's like 18 years old now, and you wouldn't know that she's. <laughs> and the other one that's really interesting story is. Uh, another brother-in-law, Jim, again, his wife couldn't have children, so <clears throat> he, he, they adopted. The first one they adopted, uh, if you do an abortion and if the fetus is trying to live, you have to resuscitate, you have to save life. Once it's out of the body, you have to do that. And that's what happened. At 20 weeks old, this, she was halfway through her pregnancy, 20 weeks long when she had it aborted. The baby was alive, trying to survive, so they had to resuscitate her, they would save her. When my uh, brother-in-law, when they <coughs> adopted her, they warned him, they said, it took a while before they actually able to bring him home, could bring him home in 20 weeks old. Likelihood of, this, that had been the earliest baby to live, you know, but being born at 20, at that time, 20 weeks was the youngest any baby had been born and lived. And they tried to abort the baby, of course. They warned him, She's going to be blind and deaf. She's not blind, she's not deaf. She's got pretty normal intelligence. She loves art. Uh, and uh, they ha are concerned that if she gets hit in the head that she could become go blind. That could happen. So they're concerned about it. They've got to be really careful. But 20 weeks old, Lord, clearly, that's a human being. I mean, if she can come out of the uterus and live, and live a pretty normal life. What does that say? Pretty amazing, I think. But okay. 
Okay, let's see. I have a problem here. Is that it? So, if any questions about before we do the PowerPoint, you want to talk about mixed lab coming. Any questions about the lab we did in write ups? Is that kind of an interesting? You're doing that? Oh, okay. Good. Also, too. Um, okay, we can have a, uh, our quiz or test. It's everything that you know is going to be based on what we cover in the labs. So we may be covering things at different rates. But one thing they pretty much the rest of this semester, maybe the rest of the year, about every other week we'll have a lab in between, we'll be a chance to talk about things, prepare for next lab, but also to discuss things. And we have plans, so I'm sure we want to go through. But if you have questions of what you're going through, you can ask me, can you talk about this or that, Mr. Bruce? I'd be glad to do that. All right, for this lab, which is lab number two, melting points and super cool, okay? That starts on page 19 in your book. <clears throat> what we're going to do is determine the melting point of a substance. Um, we need seal alcohol, well, you can see what we need on the bottom of that page. But closed in capillary tubes. The capillary tube is a really, really thin tube, glass tube. I'm going to make it round like that. One end is open and the other end is not. So this is really, I mean, this is really thin. You got to be careful, you can break it. Here's, you're going to find one like this that says, use this wire to tap the material into the capillary tube. It's fragile. So, and this has got a rubber band which you will use because you're going to wrap that around and they have a large and a small thermometer. And I'm not sure which one's best to use, but you want to hang on to that rubber band because you'll use it. And the wire is glued to this sheet that's wrapped around it. That's going to help tap it down into it. Usually what you do is you just go like this. If this is close to you, you go like this. And it goes down. But these are a bunch of little capillary tubes. As you can see, they're really thin. I don't know if you can see from there. But that's the round and the closed end, and this is the open end. So, yeah, they're really small. So you got to be careful doing your piece. And we're going to put something in a solid and tap it down. If it's a liquid, you can kind of tap it down. It might need the wire to help you because it's a solid. So, and you're going to attach this to the thermometer, okay? And as we heat it up, once you see it start to melt, so maybe a magnifying glass will help us to see better, you're going to record that temperature. In theory, what happens? Well, more than theory, it is what happens. So if something's a solid here, when it reaches the melting point, it stays that way and it's starting to melt until all of it melts because at this point, <clears throat> all of the heat is going to melt in, which means breaking the kind of bonds it has. Now, as a liquid, it doesn't have those strong bonds, crystalline type bonds between the molecules, right? So that's happening. When you finally reach uh, what's all liquid, now it goes like this. When you reach the boiling point, the same thing happens. The slope of these lines is going to be different. For water, this slope here and here is about half what it is as a liquid. Max, I've done the wrong thing. This should be more shallow. This should be, no, it takes more heat, so that's right. So, uh, this amount of heat is called latent heat, the amount to melt it or to, to vaporize it. The latent heat of, of a fusion or melting and a vaporization. And this is 0 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Celsius. But when you reach that point of melting, it's going to stay at that temperature. So it starts to melt if it happens at, let's say, 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's, well, it's going to be higher than that, but let's say at 32 degrees Celsius. It's going to stay there while it's melting, so you should be able to tell. It's not like, we've got to catch, where did it happen? Because it's going to stay at that temperature while it's melting. So that's what you're going to be doing. That's your capital tube. You've got a little wire around it. What did I do with those things? Anybody see where I am? Over here, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we try to do this to be really careful. 
Remember, you would use this rubber banding there for a girl more than once to hold the capillary tube to uh, the thermometer. We have, in the past, we've done a lot like this. We actually have a device that, that is held next to the uh, thermometer. By the way, when you do this, to do it correctly, there's the thermometer and the black tube next to it should be done just about right. Let's say you got solid right here. You want it to be the same in case there's a slightly different temperature up here than there is down here. You want it right next to that. And that's a common method that any chemistry class you take, you'll do to find the melting point of something. Okay. So, uh, I'll let you read up on that, more about this, but um, that's the physical method we're going to use. Please read it ahead of time, so you know what we're going to be doing. Okay, and now, let's see. watch this short video first before we go on to a PowerPoint on the periodic table. Um, I think that's ready to go. So as you do this, you can take a video, take a quiz, and uh, kind of to test yourself. So I always have to click on starting it. Before we get into the details of the melt, let's take a closer look phases of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. Scientists have determined the state of matter for lots of different compounds at different pressures and temperatures. A graph of these results of matter states is called a phase diagram and may look something like this. On a phase diagram, the solid boundary shows the pressure and temperature at which the substance exists in both phases simultaneously. That's because phase changes are equilibrium processes. This can be an equilibrium between solid and liquid, or between liquid and gas. So, what temperature is required to get this compound to melt? It depends. Notice that the upward pointing line in the middle leans a little to the right. This tells us that at a pressure of 260 atmospheres, which is the upper horizontal dotted line, this compound melts at about 200 Kelvin. But when the pressure is dropped, the compound melts at a lower temperature. Can the melting temperature really change? Yes. Now that we know something about phase diagrams, it will make more sense why scientists define melting point the way they do. And the same thing First, with boiling point. In everyday terms, the melting point. point is the temperature at which a substance melts or freezes. Did you catch that? The melting point is the same as the freezing point. In other words, it goes from a solid to a liquid at the same temperature that it goes from a liquid to a solid. Let's take a closer look at the everyday part of this definition. In science, everyday working conditions are usually defined as one atmosphere of barometric pressure. When we look up known values for the melting point of various substances, they're almost always defined at one atmosphere of pressure. Thus, in science, a substance's melting point is the temperature at which the solid becomes a liquid at one atmosphere of pressure. As a solid substance is heated, 
or absorbs heat from the environment, the molecules begin to have enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces, or forces that hold the molecules together in a rigid fashion, like the water molecules in ice shown here. The molecules on the outside of the sample start to melt even as the inside stays cool enough to remain solid. You've seen this before. Think about an ice cube. It melts from the outside in instead of turning into a puddle all at once. So there are really two processes. And it stays at that temperature while it's Absorbing heat energy, then using that energy to break apart the orderly lattice structure of the solid. The short answer to this is human limitations. Measurement of melting ranges requires human observation, and it requires observation of a sample large enough to observe, for most practical applications anyway. A compound's melting range starts with the temperature where the crystals first begin to liquefy, to the temperature at which the entire sample is liquid. Most pure compounds have a melting range of 1 to 2 degrees Celsius. In the lab, a narrow range like that is obtained only when the sample is heated slowly. Melting point, or more accurately melting range, is an important physical property of the compound. In the laboratory, it's one of the pieces of evidence to help you identify an unknown sample. By comparing a sample's melting range, to that of a set of known compounds from a reference book or reliable source on the internet, you can identify your unknown sample. Melting range is also a great tool for assessing the purity of an unknown sample. Pure substances melt over a narrow temperature range of just one or two degrees. Impure samples will have a much broader melting range as well as a lower melting point which is also true even when the impurity has a higher melting point than the sample of interest. The melting range of impure samples often starts at a lower temperature. For example, consider a known compound with a melting range of 54 to 56 degrees Celsius. An impure sample of this compound might have a melting range of 51 to 55 degrees Celsius which is a broader range with a lower starting temperature. It's important to know that only impurities that interfere with the compound's solid crystalline structure will affect the melting point. If, for example, you get a tiny shard of glass in your melting point capillary tube, the melting point won't be affected because the glass doesn't combine chemically with your sample. Let's take a moment to review the key points of this lesson on melting point. First, we really shouldn't talk about melting points. The everyday definition is the temperature at which a substance melts into liquid. And the scientific definition is the temperature at which the solid becomes a liquid at one atmosphere of pressure. As a solid substance is heated, the molecules begin to have enough energy to overcome the intermolecular forces or forces that hold the molecules together in a rigid fashion. But a better way to phrase this is melting range, which can be observed on phase diagrams, which are graphs of matter states results. Standard values for melting range are available and are normally defined as being measured at one atmosphere of pressure. Pure substances have narrow melting ranges, whereas impure substances may have broad melting ranges. Matching the melting range of an unknown to that of a set of known compounds is an important tool for identifying an unknown compound and assessing its purity. Okay. I actually pulled my first part of my head to correct some things on this. I mean, just there were some errors on this PowerPoint. Um, 
this is, is this actually PowerPoint? I think it should be. Yeah, okay. Now, just, just some comment on some things. Really, there is not a range of one or two degrees Celsius. What they're saying is it begins to maybe start to melt just a little bit. So there's, instead of being a rigid straight line, that's kind of curved here and it's kind of curved there. That line right here is pretty level. It's not, it's, it, it also, if you didn't mention, it depends how hard, how fast you heat it up. If you put a lot of heat there, then there could be a bigger range. If you do it more slowly, I guess they didn't talk about that, there's not as rigorous heating. It's going to be pretty much, not going to be much of a range. And wherever I, whenever I've taught chemistry, no book has ever talked about what you just did, the temperature range, the melting range. So you can just consider it to be straight like that. Um, but because they didn't talk about that on this video, it's possible that they'll ask that question about the melting range. So if it's more pure, you don't have that issue. It's really having impurities in. That allows some of the water to attach themselves to it and take longer to melt, and so it can make a difference. Anyway, uh, as a review, also, this is this time while it's melting or when it's uh, vaporizing, boiling, it's called the latent heat of fusion and the latent heat of vaporization. Um, and there's a certain amount it's done, typically, they say that how many uh, joules or calories, typically, joules per amount of matter, whether it's a kilogram or a gram, or, you know, it's, that's the way it's stated. You guys talked about heat capacity in the past? Heat capacity is, talks about this frame right here. How much heat does it take to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance to one degree Celsius? Well, the, it takes more heat than that's more slanted. If it takes less heat, the temperature goes up very quickly, right? So for water, it's one, for uh, solid, and for a gas, it's about a half that. 1.5 to 0.48 is very close to the same, roughly with water comes out to be. So, and these are at one atmosphere, the boiling point, melting point. Like the melting point of uh, water is about zero degrees Celsius, right? Be a little bit different when you, because we're not quite at one atmosphere, because we're not at sea level, we're a little above it. And atmospheric pressure varies from day to day, right? But typically it allows that the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, it's often more like 99 or so, 99 point something, not quite 100, because we're not at sea level. And, yeah, one atmosphere. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you have, does everybody have the lab report rubric? I mean, you were supposed to print that out and uh, have an extra copy of it for if somebody doesn't.
which means they have some properties of metals and some of non-metals. These are definitely non-metals, all that's red there. And this helium could be considered over here as part of this group. And that has to do with the electron configuration, which you guys, I'm sure, have covered in your books. You've already taken it, right? Yeah. So, so you're familiar with that. But that jacket line, that staircase thing, you need to be aware of. Uh, and most So this one has, it's not as clear to see the coast, but it has it, and this is the metalloids area. Um, this one doesn't, should, doesn't have it, but it's along there. So be aware of that, that area. Uh, we're going to talk about information on the periodic table. And like I said, I had to correct some things, so I actually added a couple of things that weren't all there. Here's the periodic table. You can see down below, metalloids and non-metals. So this is non-metals. These are metalloids. And then this is a basic metal uh, transistor. So these are metals over here. These are also metals. Alkali, alkali, transition. Uh, there's very few non-metals, a whole lot more metals. And that's all there is to it. Most of which you can see in very table of metals. Now, these kind of things that you should know. Nobody uses the term basic metal. I haven't seen it used before, to be honest. Alkali, alkali, transition, and then metalloids are, have properties of both. Non-metals. Halogen is a specific family name you should know. Noble gases. And the lanthanide and actinide series are the ones down below. So, uh, the range of rows and columns and the range in groups by type. Now, we'll just come on. Let's take a look at columns. Okay? This is the first column on the far left of the periodic table. That's a metal. It's called the alkali metals. So the columns of the periodic table, there are 18 of them, are called groups or families. So you got two. You have two, six, that makes eight, and ten in the middle. Of course, 14 down there. So that's a total of 18. What you're going to want as far as determining how atoms, especially covalently bond, but both covalent and ionic, is you're going to look at these right here. You're not going to worry about the transition elements because it's called a, a rule of, of oct. Of oct what do you call it? Eight. <laughs> so you got two and six is eight. The S and the P, when you cover this in your books, are the ones that really are involved in the bonding. So the middle ones you don't worry about as far as the valence. Because the nice thing is, this one may not be as clear as this one in that respect. Vans of 1, vans of 2, vans of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Actually, this would be negative 1 or 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, etc. You could, um, so it's really nice because the columnist then tells you what the, how many valence electrons. That means electrons the solid shell it has. Copper, I mean carbon rather, is in 1, 2, 3, is a fourth column, so it has four valence electrons. The four electrons that get involved in bonding. It's not that simple. Have you talked about hybridization over the summer? Okay. It's not that simple, but you'll eventually, in the second semester at that time, you'll talk about this more. Nitrogen column five, so guess how many base electrons it has? Five. Oxygen column six. Hal halogens. And then these have eight in their outer shell, but it's got a full outer shell. So if these are very inert, they don't want, you almost can't get them to react. Um, okay, so that's where, so there's 18, but in a sense there's 8 that you're concerned about as far as mm -hmm. understanding how things react, how they bond. Now this is the same group of family has similar physical added, physical and chemical characteristics or properties. Okay, they tend to have similar, you know, the 
in a certain area like transition metals tend to have uh, a higher melting point than some other metals. This one right here, this alkali, they tend to melt at a pretty low temperature. That's common. That's a physical property, not a chemical. But chemical properties are similar. So what they become reacting rolls. So this is looks like the the third row of the periodic table. This one writes the fourth row. Right here, you can see one, two, three is the fourth row or period. Um, the horizontal rows of the periodic table are called periods. It's periodic. And we're going to talk about in a moment why they begin to understand how to arrange the table the way they did. Does anybody know who was one of the first, he's Russian, scientists to come up with a periodic table? That's a good question. Mendel. Mendel. He's somebody's name you should know. I know we haven't, some of you probably haven't, most of you haven't covered this yet. I don't know if any of you did cover the periodic, have you gotten in the periodic table yet? Uh, One of the first things you do after you talk about different mixtures and compounds, etc., and some basic introduction, one of the first things you do is going to be periodic table. So you guys may not be there yet, but you will. Elements in a pair are not alike in their properties. Okay. In columns or families, they have similar properties, and they change as you go down the column, some, but they're, they have very similar properties. Whereas in periods, no. They can be a lot different. On the far left, you've got metals, like potassium. It's a pretty reactive metal, very reactive metal. Over here is krypton. It's a very reactive non-metal. It's a halogen. So they, they're not alike. The first element in the period is usually an active solid. The last element is always an inactive gas. This column right here of alkaline metals are some of the most reactive metals. Uh, like sodium, if you put a little piece of sodium in water, you can see it bounce around reacting and it will disappear, reacting with water from sodium oxide. Um, and of course, halogen is a pretty reactive non metal. Uh, and then, of course, the far, the last one will be krypton, which is noble gas or inert gas, called inert because they don't want to react. They're happy the way they are, they have a full out of shell. So that's how that works. Now, here's what happens. If you look at just the, not, not look at the transition elements yet. One, two, three, four goes through eight. And then you go back again, one through eight. And they have similar properties. What they noticed was, by the way, they couldn't, at first, scientists weren't aware of the noble gas because they're so inert, you, weren't, you couldn't know they were there. They're invisible gas, inert. So they weren't aware of it. So it's like what they're aware of is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here's the eighth one. They weren't even aware of it. And then as they went on, nine, ten, they noticed nine and seven properties the one, ten and seven properties the two. So they wanted to put nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 19, 11, 15, and then again, 16 would be here, but they weren't even aware of it. So the reason they start putting them in table like this is they notice repeating properties. And then Mendeley noticed, maybe they didn't know about these things. He predicted, based on what he saw here, that what this would be like compared to this, and even predicted and then later on discovered some of the elements that he predicted because of that. So that was kind of what, how they ended up developing the periodic table where, where it is. Uh, <clears throat> is class close to 11? 11.40. Could be a plenty of time. Now, let's look some more at roles. Ooh. This should come up one at a time. Let's see. Uh, do you is it coming up? It's there. It's the next one that doesn't have it. We have it. Uh, this is all very easy like. Okay, good. So let's go back. Slideshow from Kerner. 
because it all popped up at once. It shouldn't. Okay. Atomic number is the number of protons it increases from left to right across the period. Okay? It's the atomic number. So as you're going across here, this number on top, this is atomic number 19. It means it has 19 protons and 19 electrons. If it loses an electron, it becomes an ion, meaning it has fewer electrons, maybe only 18, but still has 19 protons. If it doesn't have 19 protons, it's not potassium. Calcium has 20 protons. If it doesn't have 20, it's not calcium, it's something else. As you go across, it increases. That's what they're saying. Um, atomic mass is the number of protons and neutrons. It also increases and go from left to right. It's also called atomic weight sometimes. So if you look at this term down here, you notice it's not, it says 39.098. why is that exactly 39? Has anybody got any ideas why that might, why it's not nice whole numbers? Because there's isotopes, different number of neutrons. So, and the average just says 19, and this is 39, it must have <coughs> 20 neutrons, 20 plus 19 is 39. But there's some that might have 21 or 22, but they're very rare. So that's why these numbers are not round, nice, neat numbers. So the atomic number is the number of protons and also the number of electrons. The atomic mass is, is the size of the nucleus, total number of protons and neutrons. <coughs> now, they said they had this backwards. Already, what was in the part of the program these changes. As you move left to right, the actual size of the volume of the molecule decreases. Why do you think that is? Why make it smaller as you move from left to right? Remember, in this row, they all have the same number of electrons in the outer shell. I'm not saying the same number of shells. So this is four outer shells. Four shells total. The outer fourth shell is What's happening to the nucleus? Is it getting bigger or smaller as you move to the right? What's happening to the nucleus as you get more protons and neutrons? Is it getting bigger or smaller as you move to the right? Oh, it's getting bigger. You're getting more positive charges. Opposite charges attract. In the outer shell, you have a certain number of electrons. It's attracted to the nucleus with a greater force because the number of protons increases, so they get the outer shell gets pulled in tighter. So as you move from left to right, the actual size of it gets slightly smaller until you get a full shell. When you go to the next one, you add another shell, the next roll, so it gets bigger. And as you go across it, so it gets smaller. And it keeps on getting bigger. And so it actually gets sl slightly smaller. So you have pictures in your book of that happening, of uh, showing what happens, but that's why. Okay, rows. Metals are on the left, non-metals are on the right. Most of the periodic table is metals of one form or another. There aren't that many non-metals. There are a lot of metalloids or semiconductors. Certain metalloids are actually semiconductors. You've probably heard that term before. <coughs> Scientists took, engineers took semiconductors and they, what's called doping it. They add certain materials to it. So it's something that, okay, which conducts electricity well, a metal or non-metal? Does glass or metal conduct electricity better? No. Metal, okay. Metal is in between. If we can get it to act a little bit more like a metal, then it will conduct electricity better. If we get it to act a little bit more like a non-metal, it won't conduct so well. So that's where it was really handy uh, in our industry, you know, the, what we have all this little devices and cell phones, everything, of all kinds of semiconductor material. And it's based on silicon, which is um, right there. It's technically a non-metal, but it's some considered to be like a metalloid. It's got semiconductor, so it can be a good conductor or, or a, you know, pretty decent conductor or a decent non-conductor insulator, depending on what the, how they add materials to it. So, now, this is something you need to be able to recognize. Sometimes, this number right here is put in the upper left-hand corner. I've seen the upper right-hand corner. But like on this one, if you notice the one you're going to pull down, it's in the upper left-hand corner. But the point at the top is the atomic number to the number of protons. 
as well as the number of electrons in the electron cloud around it, total. Weighted energy are the mass of all the elements isotopes. Around the atomic mass and the inertial number yields the mass number of the most common isotope. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, let's give an example. This is not something you need to know just yet, but I think it points out um, what's going on here. If something has six protons, it's carbon. If something has seven, it's nitrogen. Have you heard, guys heard of carbon-14 baby? Carbon-14, carbon how many, well, how big is the nucleus, do you think? Why do they call it carbon-14? Take a look at that here, what's the size of the most common isotope of carbon? Well, yes it is. The most common isotope of carbon is a total of 12. So 6 plus 1 equals 12. So carbon 12 has 6 protons and 6 neutrons. Usually you use lowercase, not capital for that. Okay, carbon 14. If it doesn't have six protons, it's not carbon. So how many neutrons does that have? Eight. Eight. Okay. Now, so if I was to draw this one, the nucleus, there's six protons, and there's also eight eight neutrons in there. What happens is, in carbon-14, every about 5,730 years, on the average, that's the half-life. The meaning if you had 800 grams of carbon-14 at the end of 5,730 years, you'd only have 400 grams of carbon-14 left. The other would have changed. It's called beta decay. Again, you don't need to know this, but here's what happens. Unfortunately, they do things backwards. They do it like this. Atomic number, it's actually the chart that's called atomic mass. When they use this notation, we call it isotope notation. It changes to where you now have seven protons in total of 14. One of these neutrons becomes a proton. It changes to beta decay. It actually changes. So now, we have seven protons and seven neutrons. If that changes to this now, we now have seven protons. What has seven protons? Is that carbon? No, it's nitrogen. It's nitrogen. It changes. And nitrogen releases the gas, leaves it. So, and then you actually have what's called beta decay, which just means it's just an electron. Um, plus what's called an anti-neutrino, which is important. It's a really small, very, very fast thing. I mean, there was a, um, a supernova that happened about like in 1985 or something like that. It was 50,000 years away. It took 50,000 years for light to reach it. A few seconds later, these neutrinos reach. So it kind of goes at 99, whatever percent the speed of light. And you have some other energy. This is just a gamma particle. It's just energy. All that really matters is they can change. If it has six protons, it's carbon. If it doesn't, it's not carbon, it's something else. That's the point I wanted to make on that. Be able to look at this and tell the different parts, the name, the symbol, the, on the periodic table, the number at the top is atomic number, down below is atomic mass and atomic weight. So uh, so just called the mass number. The sum of the number of protons and neutrons. So there's carbon 12, 6 protons, 6 neutrons. And it has 6 electrons around the outside. And you're showing them in two shells you have. Is that difficult to tell? But here's carbon. What role, there's carbon right there. What role is carbon in? Speaking of those. Pardon? The model. No, what role is it in? So oh, role, I'm sorry. The second role. Guess how many shells it has around it. Two. So if you're looking at magnesium here, it's going to have, it's got three rows. It's in the third row, third period. It's going to have three rows of, I mean, three shells of electrons around it. It's an easy thing to tell. 
downward print the pair I came from the class page break to class each week. And that's it. Um, I don't think we need any more. So we have, I think, some more time. This class goes to 11 4, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in terms of assignments, what do we have this week? Okay. Student assignments for the students. Watch the study.com video on all associated with worksheets, quizzes, and activities. We saw the student that um, we just looked at what a multi point, definition, range, determination. So you should watch that again. You've done it in class, and you should watch it again. We're not done. Let me take back. Now, I'm not going to give away to the 15. I want to see what questions they have to try to answer questions. Now, um, in a little bit, we're going to have you break up into groups and review one another's lab reports you got back and see if you can learn from each other what things you did differently. Okay? If you don't want to show your to somebody else, that's okay. Um, you are supposed to also pre-read lab two method point super cooling that we just talked about, what's going to be there. And that would be it. Um, since we didn't do a lab this week, we don't have one to do. There. All right. I had to have a lab, the lab test on labs one through three, so I know the kind of questions that they're going to ask. I don't create. I mean, I've always talked this myself in the, in the past and developed my own PowerPoints, uh, lesson plans, and tests and quizzes. But this one's developed for us, and so of course we have to use it. So uh, that's what we're going to do. So. Some things you need to know is you need to become familiar with the periodic table. What do you call the rows? There's a name for that? Periods. Pardon? Periods. Periods. And the columns are families or groups. Of course, that middle section here is called transition metals. And these are not metals, and these are all metals. But alkali, alkaline, you should know their names. Halogen. And the four you should definitely, the five you should definitely know is alkali, alkaline. Alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, transition elements, transition metals, non-metals in general, and you should know uh, that this second to last column is a halogen. Salts created from halogens are called halides. It's easy to tell. And this last column is noble or inert gases. So those specific names plus transition, those five you should know. Um, <coughs> You should be able to identify. You're going to have a picture just of carbon or oxygen or something. And if they show you oxygen here, and this is, it happens to be 16.00. Um, actually, doesn't mean that there aren't any isotopes. It just means there are just as many isotopes less than, that have less than 8 neutrons. Maybe you have 7, compared to some that maybe have nine. And if it's very small, if the percentage of those that have nine is like 0.0001%, yeah, it's not, it's so close to 60.00 stays the same. But you should be able to identify that. This is atomic mass. And looking at this, what the most common isotope, how many neutrons does it have in protons? So like for carbon, this number down there was 12.01. You would say the most common is 12 protons plus neutrons. Since we have six protons, you can figure out it's got six neutrons. Um, let's see. So, do you know what an hypothesis is? You can tell me what an hypothesis is. Educated guess. That is testable. They have. They just say in general, it's, a, it's an explanation somebody proposes to explain what's going on. You have a question or you have observed some phenomenon, you don't know why it's like that. You have your idea about what's going on. That's what it really is, okay? Um, you should be familiar with review, you know, the safety rules for the lab, etc. Um, be able to convert using dimensional analysis from one form to another. Okay, so 
if I gave you centimeters and I asked for what would that be in millimeters? You may not know how many millimeters in a centimeter, centimeters in millimeters. So I have to know what centimeter really means. So let's say we have 12.1 centimeters, and I want you to convert that to millimeters. You may not know that there's 10 millimeters per every centimeter, but you do know that there are 100 centimeters in a meter. And in one meter, there's 1,000 millimeters. So you can still end up there, right? Does this make sense? Centimeters goes away, meters goes away, and you end up with that. 1,000 divided by 100 is 10, so it's going to be 121, right? I want you to show dimensional analysis when you do any calculations, okay? You will be using dimensional analysis this time like you ever did before, even more than if, if, how many of you are planning on taking physics in your time now? Okay, more than you use in physics. Physics is just as mathematical as chemistry, maybe more, but, um, but dimensional analysis you use in chemistry more than anything. When you do what's called stoichiometry, which is our calculations of what's going on in some reaction, and maybe give you grams of this material, you've got to convert it to moles, which is, and then from moles to moles of the, the uh, product, and from that back to grams. You, you want to get good at this. So um, remember what chromatography is all about. Know the terms of things like a beeper, a pipette that we use to get a little bit of water transfer from one place to another, graduated cylinders, those are capillary tubes we talked about. You know what a thermometer is. Um, know what an atom is. Um, If you have any reaction, know what the what you start out with, what do you call that? Oh. What they start with? Pardon? What they start out with? Wait, no, no, in any reaction. What you start out with, the left side is called reactants, the right side is called products, what you end up with. So um, if we had um, balance it, I'm going to put a 2 in front of here, so I need a 2 in front of here, and I think that balances it. Yeah. These are called reactants. And this, your output is called your products. So, um, let's see. I have, I, what I did is I got, uh, you can get meal, or they're called water enhancers. It's drops you can add to, you can get Gatorade, but it adds something in here that helps my body absorb the, use the water. You know what that's called? It starts with an E. Electrolytes. Electrolytes. So, all it means is they're ions. Typically, metal, calcium, magnesium, etc., ions. And if you look up Gatorade, look at the bottle, they bring it in, I don't have some outside, it will list the different electrolytes that are in there. So if you have, like, these are both to be electrolytes. This would break down to sodium and chlorine. And this would break down to calcium, double bond, and nitrate which is one minus, but there's going to be two of those. Um, so anyway, 
um, and the door of the tubes in front, which gives one molecule that breaks down and does that. Those are called um, electrolytes. And of course, this is the same thing. You can say that this is calcium 2 plus, and it's got chlorine 1 minus. Or, and the same thing with this, the way it breaks down. So they're called electrolytes. Uh, How many electrolytes are really salty? Pardon? Yes, yeah, they are. By definition, a salt is just a metal and a non-metal combined together. It's called salt. <clears throat> so calcium oxide, that's a salt. Uh, let's see. When you talk about mixtures, you want to take water and add salt to it to form salt water. What do you call salt water? Salt. What do you call guys? What do you call salt water? What do you call that? What do you say? It's a mixture, but there's a particular name when you dissolve one thing into another. You mix it's, all 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 it's a solution. A solution. In a result is called a solution. What do you call what you dissolve into the liquid? Solvent. Okay, what you dissolve into is solute. What you're dissolving into the water is called solvent. Solute, solvent, end up a solution. So salt is the solute. It almost sounds like salt solute, right? And water is a solvent, and what you end up with is a solution. You can have two solids, an alloy, you know, like is maybe copper and zinc. You got brass, but it's they're kind of dissolved together. You know, two gases can do it, and two liquids can. Um, so if you get hydrogen peroxide, we used in the lab, take a lot of recently, it's three percent hydrogen peroxide. Whenever there's two liquids, you say, which one is it? do we have more of? 3% hydrogen peroxide means there's 97% water. Since there's more water, water is a solvent. The solute is actually the hydrogen peroxide. So um, any alcohol you know, that around the house you drink, I mean, you don't drink, but <laughs> do. this there, or rubbing alcohol, it doesn't have you know more than 50%. Like, but if you had something that was um, there would never be 100% or even more 50%. But if it was, then that solvent, the solvent would be the alcohol, the sol solute would be the water. Um, you should know about melting points and what cooling below the melting point is called super cooling. When you actually get it to cool below it, so it works. Okay. I guess that's basically some of the things I think you need to know. Um, I'm, I'm done. If you guys have questions about anything you're going through in your, in your book or something, you guys have So that's, I mean, it is 11.40 now, but they did say we could, but it's too late. I want to look at each other's lab reports to get some ideas what you know, maybe we could have done better. Um, I remember at the beginning of the year, of the year they talked about lab reports and said we should have a couple of references. So I uh, saw so some of this one. That's because you can always use this book as one reference. You want something else in addition to that. That's the idea. So if you just list this, then that's not the easy to do research. They want party. They want to encourage you to do research, to uh, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, look around, you know, and to, to understand the lab you're doing a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. Anybody here big Falcon fans? Yeah. <laughs> Not anymore, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so that is so sad. I, when they were up. Uh, 29 to 10 and a half like that. And then suddenly quickly in the third quarter got down to five points. I thought, no, I can't believe it. Then we got it back up to 15 points. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. we're all right. We're 15 points with less than eight minutes to go. We're okay. No. Sorry. Sorry, great. Have you ever, I've never seen where they spin the ball sideways where it goes across. They all you do is what takes a ready bounces, you know. But they did something different. And we just watched it. 
It's just crazy. Because you can get close. And by the way, you should be blocking. You shouldn't all be around the ball. You should be blocking one another. So yeah. you, the, some foul is going to hit the, 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 the uh, guy, kickoff team guy away from the ball. And somebody else pop can jump on. We can touch the ball when it's cut out on 10 yards. They can't. You let it go 10 yards and see if you can get to the ball first instead of, we can always just jump on. My dog, I like to, you know, I have this little ball I bounce and he loves and wants to get it, but he won't go for it unless I get so close he thinks he can get it. And then he'll grab it before I can. Well, it's the same thing, you know, you have the advantage. You don't know, you know, they have to wait. Oh, you don't know how we. So I'm assuming they lost. <laughs> they lost. They were <laughs> up. And they lost the uh, uh, Dallas to score 30 points in the second half. They were up 29 10. They lost 40 to 39. The last play of the game. Field goals. Yeah. Onside kick work, which shouldn't have. But the Braves won that day, so. Yeah. <laughs> so I just could not believe that. That's. Oh. I think people, I've heard people, when they heard those happening, they were tearing off their, their pocket jersey, not sure to wear it, you know, people breaking their TV sets because...
formulic acid based on acetyl alcohol. figured out the problem. Good. I think. Um, oh, this one actually recorded. Good. Good, good.